within the cult, within the Batak culture itself, has a lot of differences in terms of sub-ethnic group. So is it Batak Taro or what kind of Batak are we talking about? And then religious difference. There were Batak Muslims and Batak Christians. Gender differences, right? Um, class differences, education differences, linguistic differences, and so on. So those differences within the same culture is not, a lot of time is not considered by self, is by multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is only interested in that particular representative culture that represent that ethnic group and how that is put uh, in juxtaposition vis-a-vis -vis another culture. Okay, so that is quite problematic. Multiculturalism does not allow for space, uh, sorry, does not allow space for differences of interest um, and power within minority, right? Such as class, gender, religion, age, and even culture. So the question that we can ask is that, how multicultural is multiculturalism? Is it truly um, multicultural? <clears throat> now, multiculturalism insists on an essentialist ethnic character that requires an authentic history. Now, when multiculturalism as a policy decides which ethnic culture to represent, sometimes it only picks those that uh, is exotic. Sometimes it picks those that has an authentic history. So it depends on the population of that group <clears throat> and then how much authenticity they can, they can prove, right? So the more exotic um, the culture is expressed, right, the more uh, it is seen to be included in multiculturalism. It fails to accommodate hybridized identity for people who live in between cultures. Uh, so <clears throat> in our globalized world, as you know, we get more and more influences from um, various kinds of media, the internet, um, pop culture, uh, even you know, uh, and of course with uh, travel and so on. But even, even though you, you don't have to travel, you know, you may also become, you have, may also have become a cultural hybrid just from the media sources that you consume, right? So there may be a bit of Korean in you because of K-pop influence. There may be a little bit of Chinese in you. There may be a little bit of, Javanese in you, even though you are Sundanese, and so on and so forth. Right? Multiculturalism failed to accommodate hybridized identity. It's not interested in people who are in between categories. It is only interested in people who stay within the box neatly defined um, by, by uh, multiculturalism. <clears throat> so then, you know, cultural boundaries are essentialized as fixed, static, monolithic, unchanging. Right, that say if you are a, um, a Chinese in multiculturalism, you have to wear Chinese costume, you have to speak Chinese, you have to eat Chinese food to show that authenticity that you are truly Chinese. And then, and then that is the kind of model ethnicity that multiculturalism would acknowledge and also give resources to. Now, so that sometimes breed uh, racism it becomes a platform a um, ground, fertile ground for racism to prevail, right? Under the veil of political correctness that people don't talk about their difference, right? They're obsessed only with the diversity, the display of diversity rather than the engagement of difference, okay? Now, if we look at the identity politics in post Suharto Indonesia, Um, which is when multiculturalism emerged as a new paradigm, as a new cultural paradigm for, for Indonesia. Um, politics of representation in new multicultural environment. The most obvious change that we see uh, in post Suharto Indonesia is the wave of resinicization. 
okay, which is the permission for Chinese culture to re-emerge in Indonesian public sphere, something that has been banned um, and marginalized for more than three decades um, under the uh, 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 fear of the threat of um, communism, right? So, so from, you know, during Soharo's time that you don't see any expression of Chineseness, right? Chinese shops change their name to Indonesian name. Or, um, Ch Chinese people change their name to Indonesian sounding name. Um, all the Chinese characters were, were, were disallowed and Chinese newspapers were, were, were shut down. And also Chinese schools were being shut down. To so suddenly after 1998, you see all these expression of Chinese started to come up. Right, Imlek, you know, uh, red lanterns and people wearing Chinese costumes and so on, right? Um, and and we, we call that resinicization. Now, the issue with resinicization is that um, there is a return to Chineseness, but what kind of Chineseness? It is a return to primordial Chineseness, not a hybrid Chineseness. It is a return to a, an imaginary Chineseness that's based on some form of mythical um, imagination of authenticity, right? Not the lived reality of Chinese Indonesian, which is a very hybrid, a very Indonesianized Chineseness, right? Now, so then essentialism and self-essentialism became, um, became a, a central part of such process of resynthesization, right? It is a rhetorical performance that is used by ethnic community leaders to invoke a communal identity. Now, self-essentialism can be seen as a competition like Koko Chichi, for example, right? The equivalent to Abang None in Jakarta, uh, which is a competition of choosing, um, like a pageant uh, com competition of choosing, you know, uh, a good looking uh, representative of the ethnic group. Uh, and they also need to have good grasp of the ethnic culture and language. But if you look at the, the Koko Chichi uh, competition and just looking at their costumes and so on, it is very essentialist. You don't see Chinese Indonesian that you know um, in your school or uh, in your neighborhood and so on wearing this in their everyday life, right? So it is a very artificial, uh, essentialized, uh, way of showing your identity. Now, ironically, that is what you know multiculturalism likes to promote because it shows a visual uh, way of showing diversity, right? Uh, it is very visual, right? So all discursive acts of naming and labeling constitute essentialism. All ethnicities um, and all identity are essentialist. So when we are naming a particular group, we are essentializing, right? So, so it is actually quite hard to not to essentialize because every label in itself is essentialist, right? Now, essentialism can be a form of objectification, right? Which is a positive type of collective self-identification, or it can be uh, a form of reification, which is a distortion and a way to silence difference. Now, while essentialism can never be entirely avoided, the motive of any essentialist representation needs to be scrutinized to determine whether it is a self act of identification or is it xenophobic reification, okay? The strategy taken by cultural actors to express a particular version of Chineseness, right, either essentialist version of Chineseness or hybridized Chinese of uh, Chineseness, depends largely on the agency and power um, how how they are uh, exercised. Right. Um, We see that those actors behind the promotion of an essentialist and primordial form of Chineseness are mostly older generation Chinese. And these are uh, retired Chinese people in their 70s, 80s years old. So they grew up in the 60s before um, the Suharto's era 
when Chinese schools were still around, when they call it the golden age of Chinese, um, Chinese-ness in Indonesia. And so they, um, in their old age, they are rich. A lot of them are entrepreneurs um, and they're retired. They've got nothing much to do. So they see themselves as having this cultural mission to help the assimilated Chinese to uh, rekindle their Chinese roots. Now, so then they use um, primordial Chinese-ness to um, express their nostalgia, right, for um, pre-Sohato Indonesia. Now, so you will see that, you know, the, the financial power that they have allows them to promote a particular form of cultural expression. But of course, the younger generation Chinese Indonesian who are very assimilated, who grew up speaking Indonesian, you know, eating Indonesian food and so on, who don't identify anything with, with Chinese-ness, you know, they would like to promote their version of Chinese-ness, but they don't have the vehicle and they don't have the resources to do that. So when they join a Chinese organization, the Chinese organization is normally held by this older generation who have the financial power, right? Um, and then the older generation's agenda would be then pushed to this younger generation, right? And then now with the rise of China, we see there are more incentive for primordial um, form of Chinese-ness to be, to be prioritized or to be expressed because that could actually uh, become a resource for Indonesia to build uh, trade relationship with China, okay? Now I want to talk about hybridity, which um, is a concept that help us push the boundaries or even cross the boundaries of multiculturalism. Now, so what is hybridity? There are um, different kinds of hybridity. One, we call it unintentional hybridity or organic hybridity. Uh, which is according to Bakhtin, which is a linguist, right? Uh, it talks about organic hybridity as something that's unconscious, right? Um, uh, unconscious kind of hybridity that is a feature of history uh, and evolution of um, historical evolution of all languages. So, all languages as it evolved, it has gone through. Um, particular form of hybridity, right? So when we talk about Indonesian today, Indonesian that we that, that we are speaking today, uh, it is a very hybrid language, right? It is adopted from Malay, and uh, and one of the reasons why Indonesian is adopted as a lingua franca in Indonesia is because Malay language itself is very flexible. It has gone through. Um, waves and waves, generations and generations of hybridity, of creolization. Malay itself is such a flexible language that, you know, it was, it has absorbed uh, uh, Arabic influences when Islam came in, right? Um, it has absorbed colonial influences. It has, you know, in uh, the Malay world, they have used Jawi, which is a form of Arabic script to write Malay. And then using the Romanized character. And then it has absorbed a lot of influences and elements of Indian or Hindic influences, right? So, skolah, for example, is an, uh, uh, an, an, an Indic word, right? And all kind of um, um, borrowed words from India when uh, the Hindic influences uh, had on this archipelago. And then uh, Indonesian language and the Malay language has also absorbed, uh, borrowed a lot of words from Chinese, especially when we talk about food, numbers, and so on, right? So, so that is an example of an organic hybridity, something that 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 um, uh, that went through a process through generations, yeah, and it's a very organic kind of process. So for example, you know, in Indonesia, especially in Jakarta, when Jakartans talk about numbers, right, uh, they will use Hokkien terms, right? Um, cheng, right, go cheng, five uh, lima ribu, you know, uh, and so on, right? Go ban, 
uh, 50 ribu and so on and uh, and all those are Hokkien um, Chinese Hokkien dialects right which has become a form of Jakartan dialect right so bah bahasa uh, Jakarta or uh, Betawi right it's been absorbed into that and then you look at Bakmi uh, Bakmi is actually also from Chinese influence right um, Uh, soto also came from Chinese influence. Siu mai is is Chinese food, and so on. And they they have all now become in part of Indonesian food, right? Um, the Indonesian bahasa gaul, right? Uh, Gue lu, and so on. These are all Hokkien words, right? Which is a, a Chinese dialect, right? Which has also become um, an integral integral part of Indonesian language. Now, so this is organic hybridity, right? Now. Hybridity is, is interesting because as a concept, it forces us to think beyond the watertight categories of multiculturalism, um, the way in which culture is being formulated and, and imagined in, in the frame of multiculturalism. Now, so cultures evolve historically through borrowings, appropriation, exchanges, and inventions, right? It is a long process um, of um, cross-cultural Uh, flows and cultural mixture um, has accelerated rapidly with the proliferation of globalization. The notion of hybridity is tied to the idea of cultural syncretism, which foregrounds complicated cultural entanglement, which means that culture has always been entangled, right? They are all um, fused with each other. It's really hard to, to try to pull them out and 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 define them in an essentialized way because they have been fused together for generations. Now, hybridity therefore confronts and problematizes boundaries, um, but it does not erase them. So hybridity as a concept, it challenges cultural boundaries. So if we say that this is Japanese culture and it has not changed for the past 2000 years, now hybridity said, not really. You know, even Javanese language has borrowed from other languages as well, from Dutch and so on, right? So it has changed, right? It has borrowed from Indonesian Malay language as well. And Indonesian has borrowed its words from Javanese language as well and so forth, right? So, so it's really hard for you to pull them out and, and define all this culture in a centralized way. Hybridity suggests a blurring of boundary. And also an unsettling of identities. Now, so that is unintentional organic hybridity. What about intentional hybridity? Now, intentional hybridity uh, is the kind of cultural forms that is packaged and coupled with forces of capitalism and globalization, right? For example, now we see that you know um, festivals like World Music Festival, fusion food, and so on has become. Um, more and more popular, um, that scholars call this happy hybridity, uh, which means that you know it shows understanding of cross-cultural encounters as involving little tension, uh, conflict or contradiction, and assumes no history or politics. So there's a mixture of cultural influences in uh, commercial goods that we are consuming, right, which has become very popular. Uh, for example, um, uh, you look at the photo on the left, that is popa, uh, popa cake, right, from the um, uh, Taiwanese milk tea, right, the boba <coughs> um, bubble tea, right, and then made it into a cake, right. And then you see uh, the pasta in the center. And that one is Japanese pasta, right, so it is pasta, which is based on uh, Italian uh, cuisine, but it is also very Japanese, you know, with the fish roll, fish eggs and things like that, seaweed. And the next one you see is McDonald's, right? This one is found in uh, Malaysia um, and Brunei in Singapore as well. They call it nasi lemak burger, right? So a burger with um, sambal and also with ikan bilis and so on, which is You know, and, and these are intentional hybridity that we see a lot of these kind of expressions, cultural expressions in the things that we consume. But according to scholars, these are not natural. These are not organic. These are 
something that is deliberately packaged by the market for the consumers. Now, how did hybridity originate as a term? Now, hybridity, um, when it first started, it has a, an epistemological origin in pseudoscientific racism. It is a racist term because uh, it involves uh, the methodology the mythology of miscegenation, which means uh, racial blending, racial mixing, right? And during the colonial times, there was a lot of anxiety over mixed race uh, offspring. So children of mixed race uh, marriage, um, uh, because they are seen to be crossing the boundary. So there was a lot of anxiety, especially that white women <clears throat> will be seduced by black or brown men in the colon in the colonized world right so you know there were posters and so on to to warn people how uh, dangerous this is because these people are barbaric they are going to contaminate the white race right so if you look at this sitting in the um, top of the table is a white gentleman and then next to him is a, uh, a, a tribal person, right? And then this tribal person is seen as a sexual predator. You see, he's having his hand on a white woman, right? And if he wins over the white woman, the consequence will be having a bastard, right? A mixed race. And, and then the white woman's um, status will drop because she has become contaminated. So you see the way in which black people or tribal indigenous people were seen uh, portrayed is very primitive, right? No difference to the primates or animals, right? Now, so these are very racist way of representation of the colonized culture. And, and, and hybridity used to be a dirty word because it, it it shows this kind of mixture, which is seen as highly undesirable in the colonial history. But what about today? Now today, hybridity seems to have um, taken, taken a, a, a different, uh, a very different um, a move where, you know, some people actually take pride of their mixed heritage, right? So, so, for example, you know, Megan, um, uh, who uh, is mixed, and then she's really rocking the, 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 uh, the British um, royal family, right, by accusing them of racism and so on, right? Now, so, so we have to think about the case of Indonesia, right? Uh, is hybridity um, part of the social reality of Indonesia? Um, are Indonesians hybrid, right? Um, are you a hybrid, right? So do you think of yourself as a hybrid or do you think of yourself as someone who is, you know, um, holding an essentialist identity, okay? And then what about the notion of ke'aslian? What does ke'aslian mean, right? Um, is it a myth? Um, is the imagination of asli um, uh, something that is tangible? Does it reflect the reality, right? Is it important to be pure, right? The whole reason why hybridity is being condemned um, for a very long time in Western uh, discourse is because that it is seen as something that is contaminating, that it is impure, right? Why is the concept of purity so important in ethnic discourse, right? Now, hybridity um, and cultural translation. Hybridity is a con continuous and often convoluted process of cultural translation that is never complete. Now, so as we are speaking now, you know, we are hybridizing, right? We, we are in a very hybridized kind of um, um, setting as well, right? Um, the language that we are using now here is English, which is not 
your or my first language, right? Um, it is a borrowed language, which has become a lingua franca, an international language that people use, right? And, and, and that is a form of hybridity, right? The technology that we're using also shows a particular form of hybridity, right? That we are seeing each other, but then yet we are very far. So we seems to be we seem to be close to each other because your face is in front of mine, or in front of my camera, but yet we are very far, right? So so technology is now really making things, making you know, especially with virtual reality, it becomes very hard for you to distinguish what is real and what is unreal, right? Now with all these AI um, technologies, Chat GBT, and also AI apps that can that can change your face, they can change your costume, you can ask them to draw you in all kinds of different uh, ways, right? Uh, the differentiation is the distinction between reality and virtual reality um, is become harder to and harder to differentiate. So, so all this shows that, you know, hybridity is something that has become um, very pervasive Right. And if multiculturalism as a paradigm still insists on an essentialist mode of identity, it will soon become very hard for it to, um, to realistically uh, capture the diversity in our society. Right. Um, now with migration, for example, migration is a great example to show how um, hybridity uh, is, is a lived example of migrants, right? Uh, the migrant who experiences multiple rootedness and consciousness is forever mixing and mixed, forever crossing, traversing, translating linguistically and culturally. They are not either or, but both. Now, a lot of time, People ask migrants, especially diaspora, second generation, uh, third, fourth generation, um, say Arab in Indonesia, Chinese in Indonesia, or now increasingly there, there is a large Indonesian diaspora overseas, right? Second, third, fourth generation Indonesian who live in Australia, Indonesian who, who live in Netherlands and so on. And if people ask them, are you Indonesian or Dutch? It is very difficult for them to actually answer that, right? Because sometimes they see themselves as both, right? It depends on what circumstance um, you're referring to. So in one situation, when you're asking them, are you uh, Indonesian or Dutch? Uh, if they're living, if they were born in Netherlands and they grew, grew up in Netherlands, in terms of citizenship, the passport they hold, they are Dutch nationality, right? But then culturally, um, they may be very Indonesian because their parents insisted in speaking in Indonesian with them, eating Indonesian food at home, watching Indonesian TV shows, and so on. So, so part of them culturally is very Indonesian. And hybridity is a concept that does not need you to choose whether you are Indonesian or Dutch. It can be both, right? But assimilation, um, as we uh, mentioned last week, um, for this to happen, in an assimilation um, policy, it's, it's impossible because assimilation treats identity as a discrete singular entity and it forces people to choose. Most of the time, it forces people to choose the majority culture, right? And to give up or to erase their minority heritage, right? So for example, one can either be an Indonesian or Chinese. So if you want to be a real Indonesian, you have to give up all your Chinese culture, right? And so hybridity as a concept then may deconstruct such dichotomy that one can be both Indonesian and Chinese. Now, so, so what I'm really trying to demonstrate here is the way in which the concept of hybridity may actually break down the discrete categories that multiculturalism um, have maintained, as we talk about, uh, especially in the case that we um, we raised last week on the Singapore uh, CMIO model of multiculturalism, 
right? The Chinese, Malay, Indian, other um, model, which the state, the Singapore government, strongly enforced that ethnic and cultural boundary through um, uh, the education system and, and through the, um, all kinds of um, racial quotas in Singapore, which makes it impossible for people to cross those boundaries. But in reality, most people are actually a product of multiple cultures. But then um, as far as the state is concerned, at the end of the day, the state will only allow them to tick one box out of the CMIO um, racial categories. So if we compare identity uh, with hybridity, uh, identity is based on essentialism and primordialism. So when we talk about an identity, when we use an identity label, say, if I call myself a Chinese, then I am already essentializing because I will have to base that definition. I have to qualify that definition with a set of primordial um, characteristics. Right. Um, so identity seems to resist hybridization, right? And hybridity is the antithesis of hybridity because hybridity is anti-essentialist. It is trans transgressive. Right? It focuses on the roots of becoming and not the roots of where you came from, right? Um, Hybridity blurs and traverses boundaries that identities have established and undermining the in integrity and purity uh, that the boundaries attempt to safeguard. Now, for example, in Indonesia, there used to be a very clear distinction between the two types of Chinese community. Now, one is the Totok Chinese community, which is very much based on primordial Chineseness, right? Um, they speak, they spoke Chinese, and they um, are very China oriented, and so on. Versus the Peranakan, the Peranakan are very localized. They spoke Indonesian. They ate Indonesian form. They are, they are the Baba, the Nyonya, and so on. So they embody the hybrid Chineseness. Now these two camps seem to be in opposition to each other. Um, I think I'll skip the question on the third space because that it's a bit too cultural studies and too postmodern uh, for us to raise here. Um, now, hybridity traverses boundaries, uh, as we mentioned, because hybridity does not force you to choose between one category or the other category. It allows you to be both, right? So on one hand, hy hybridity can be an empowering concept because it allows one to escape from essentialist identity categories, right? That especially you don't feel like you fit in to this particular category. You don't feel like this category, this label um, uh, uh, justifiably uh, defines you and your identity, you just refuse to be labeled. And I think most of the time now, all the, uh, Gen, the Gen Zs are doing that, right? You ask them, you know, um, uh, to label themselves. They say, you know, I, I don't label myself. I am non, even, you know, in terms of gender, I'm, I'm non-binary, right? Um, I refuse to label myself and so on, right? So, so it is something that is actually quite um, normalized. Uh, so, so it can be empowering in that sense, right? Being a hybrid, right? Because you can uh, have multiple belonging. You can enjoy the best of both worlds. However, it can also be this empowering when the societal structure is still defined on the basis of essentialism, right? So, if the societal culture is still very conservative and does not accept hybridity, then you'll find that you know being a cultural uh, hybrid, or if you insist on your hybrid uh, uh, character, you will be very much disadvantaged 
right? If you get into politics, for example, and so on, where where now, you know, politics in Southeast Asia is becoming more and more religionized, right? So so people, politicians are trying to show their religiosity as much as possible, right? Now, so 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 there is more advantage of of hanging on to essential essentialist notion of identity uh, than uh, a non-essentialist one, uh, such as hybridity. Right. Um, so hybridity at the end of the day still depends on the willingness of the cultural uh, dominant group uh, to abandon the automatic assumption of universalism and privilege, right? Uh, so coming back to last week's Andy's question on the tyranny of the majority, I think it's still very much that right? in our society, um, even though you will see that most of the younger generation are quite culturally hybrid, right? But if the um, major majority group is, if the hegemonic group uh, in the society uh, still holds an essentialist view to identity and rejects hybridity, then they will force you to, to become um, what they want you to be, right? In order to be accepted in that community. Let me give you an example. In, in Brunei, uh, most of the Malay, uh, educated Malay Bruneians speak English as their first language, right? Um, because uh, uh, Brunei sent a lot of uh, students to the UK to study for, for many decades. Um, so a lot of the more elitist families, uh, middle and middle upper middle class family, uh, would have their family members or their parents and so on educated in the UK. So they are all very modern. They speak very good English. Um, they are very British in themselves. Now, uh, but the Brunei government, after independence in 1984 insist uh, very much in the new national ideology called Malayu Islam Raja, right, which uh, insists on a very essentialist notion of Malayness, Islam, and also monarchy. Now, so then um, the Speak Malay campaign has been emphasized by the government. So if you go to old government offices and so on, you have to speak Malay, otherwise they will not entertain you. And so then, um, and, and also uh, you have to wear the traditional uh, Malay costume. Uh, in Brunei, we call it uh, the, chara, the Chara Malayu um, and uh, Baju Kurung for the ladies. And so uh, Baju Chara Malayu and Baju Kurung uh, has become the, uh, uh, the epitome of what a Bruneian uh, uh, should be, right? And so a lot of these uh, Bruneian Malays who return from the UK, right, who don't speak Malay and, and don't really go to mosque and so on, found that now, uh, because they were government scholars, so they received a government scholarship and they come back, they are bonded with the government. And for them to work in the government, to be accepted by their colleagues and to be able to get promotion and things like that, they will have to play by the rules. So you will see them gradually uh, wearing the Baju Chara Malayu. You will see them gradually using more and more Malay. You will see them um, behaving like uh, very good Muslims uh, and, and, and things like that, uh, just to conform to the essentialist notion. And then uh, a lot of them actually live a very compartmentalized uh, life in which, you know, when they're at home, they are very hybridized. They don't wear their Head, head scarf and whatnot, you know, and speak English. And whether when they go to government offices and work, they suddenly become very, very Malay, right? So, so some people uh, do that, but identity is is it's really about performance anyway, right? Now, so at the end of the day, it is about the cultural hegemonic group, the dominant group, right? The tyranny of the majority. Um, how does the, the the majority define the rule? Okay. Now, hybridity is nonetheless a site of anxiety. A lot of government, gov a lot of governments are fearful of hybridity, right? Because the perception of cultural purity is seen as important for the development of nationalist sentiment, right? 
the government doesn't like to deal with hybrids because hybrids are undefinable. They challenge different rules. They don't like labels, right? Um, they don't like to be categorized, right? Now, so, so for the state to develop a national identity, right? The hybrids are problematic for the state, right? So the state will then insist on particular uh, uh, version of the national culture and then insist that that is a pure form of the national culture. Now, just now I, I mentioned about the Brunei ideology of uh, Malayu Islam Raja. Uh, Malayu Islam Raja is a um, state ideology that was actually uh, formulated starting the late 50s by the former Sultan. And then it was uh, formally uh, announced in 1984 as the state philosophy uh, during Brunei's National Day, uh, the first uh, Independence Day. Now, but then uh, within MIB as an ideology, um, it always insists that MIB has a long history of 500 years or 600 years that, that it has been practiced in Brunei monarchy for 600 years, unbroken, undisturbed. Um, and people have always um, insisted on the same kind of um, principles for 600 years, right? Um, so, so something that was constructed in 1984, uh, it's, it's, it's traced back to a longer history to gain legitimacy, right? And, and even though, you know, everyone knows that that is mythical, um, because if you just look at Brunei's uh, photos, in the 60s, um, Brunei dressed differently from now. Now it's 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 very conservative and very Islamized. In the early days before um, uh, 1984 independence, Brunei is very liberal and is very very modern, very Western, right? Um, all the archival photos will show that, right? Um, uh, but then you know, um, uh, since the state uh, wanted to. Um, built a national identity, so people would just have to go along uh, with that myth of um, of the essentialism of of MIB, right? Because it, it is um, the state ideology is very similar to Pancasila during Suharto's time. That uh, you know the um, um, status of this ideology cannot be challenged. If you are challenging, if you challenge this ideology, you'll be seen as a, a bad Bruneian um, and, and, and you will be punished by the state, right? Now, so impurity, mixture, fusion, and lack of identity that hybridity manifests are threatening to governments, right? The governments uh, perceive hybridity as a force that can undermine sovereign national identity, which is constructed in terms of cultural purity and authenticity. Uh, yet the messy reality that hybridity represents has inadvertently undermined the evocations of social order, right? Uh, practically also, it is very hard for hybridity uh, to be institutionalized um, as a policy because hybridity itself is undefinable. It's a, it's a very postmodern kind of a creation. Uh, so how do you enumerate hybrids? I mean, the state policies requires everything to be in statistics. Um, and uh, if a hybrid does not even uh, want to be labeled uh, or categorized, how do you enumerate them, right? I think this is this is my last slide, and then I'll open it up for discussions and questions. Now, um, can hybridity be institutionalized? Now, current discussions on hybridity uh, have not yet taken into serious consideration the economic and social relations of power. Now, it is important, right? Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, hybridity uh, comes from a, a very postmodern uh, and cultural studies kind of discipline, right? So, so it is uh, a very dis different discipline from political science, which is 
which is a lot more um, um, pragmatic. Um, so, so hybridity has not really considered the social economic relations of power, right? Now, hegemonic cultural hierarchies based on essentialism are still very much sustained within cultural institutional practices. So we still see that particular ethnic group um, are considered as dominant, hegemonic, and, 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 and um, they normally are um, the more powerful uh, uh, people in the society, right? So what exactly are the possibilities for using hybridity to address structural inequalities um, and uh, issues related to social justice? How can we use this as a concept to, to challenge um, uh, such issues right, of social justice and inequalities? Does everyone have the same access to mobilizing hybridized agency? Now, hybridity also seems to be uh, um, a resource of the younger generation. As I mentioned just now, the Gen Z um, uh, in particular, um, uh, and also people who have access to, to media, access to the internet, who have access to education, who have access to language, who have access to um, pop culture and so on, right? Um, so, so does everyone have the same access right, to such mobility? Um, what are the effective uh, and political investments involved in either wanting or refusing to accept hyphenated hybrid identifications, especially in increasingly conservative political climates. Now, so, so as we see that post 9-11, as we um, discussed last week after 9-11, the whole world order has changed and political conservatism seem to be the order of the day. So we see conservative governments are being installed almost everywhere, um, being elected by the people because um, in a uncertain, um, in an uncertain world with terrorism, with economic decline, with recessions, with people losing their jobs and so on, the last thing that people want to elect is a progressive liberal government that um, want to experiment with different things and may not um, know where they're heading. Now, so um, whereas hybridity is a very liberal um concept right that 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 the um normally the more left-wing liberal government will will welcome um, but not with right-wing conservative government right so just imagine if if trump would would even consider hybridity in his policy right so so would you know um, hybridity uh be seen as a worthy political investment um by by politicians right so so, uh, I mean, as a concept, it is an interesting concept for us to push boundaries of multiculturalism and for us to rethink about culture uh, in a non-essentialist way, right? Um, but in reality, it is quite hard um, if we want to elevate and push it uh, into a, um, a policy level, okay? So with that, I think I will, I will stop here and I welcome uh, your discussions and your questions. Thank you, Professor Hoon. Uh, please, anyone uh, have question or maybe opinion about uh, relevant to the our discussion? Silakan, teman-teman. Yeah, I think uh, maybe may I make uh, some comments or question, Professor Hood? Sure, sure. Okay, uh, I think it is uh, very uh, interesting, yeah, about the hy hybridity. And if we look uh, today in Indonesia facing uh, election in the next year, as we know that uh, now uh, the political discourse uh, uh, overwhelmed by the 
identity discourse yeah, that uh, we can uh, uh, we can suggest that uh, the political parties or the politician to use the concept hybridity however it is the idealized uh, thing but however uh, as you say that the social structure is essentialist yeah uh, and then the logic of politics that uh, the number of votes uh, direct the politician to use the essentialist uh, campaign yeah and uh, also the success team and also the uh, the supporters yeah for example now the in the previous time uh, ahok yeah uh, he suffered from the uh, identity uh, apa, uh, serangan identitas ya terhadap ahok and now uh, anis baswedan also uh, experience the same thing with his uh, arab or yemeni background so uh, what do you uh, think about the uh, the phenomenon of political in indonesia is it uh, the the electoral process is uh, apa, uh, give the stronger to essentialism yeah is it uh, the potency to hybridity can be uh, spread in the indonesian uh, social and political sphere or is it uh, pessimistic yeah because the political process uh, apa, selalu ter, ter, apa, tertarik oleh essentialist uh, social structure. Maybe that's my question. Thanks, Pak Ari. V very interesting question, really. Um, a lot of food for thoughts for us. Um, I, I, I think, you know, um, political campaigns and elections and so on, um, has been, especially in Southeast Asia, has been built on uh, very essentialist notions of uh, identity politics and racial politics. Uh, in Malaysia as well, that has happening, that has been happening. Uh, the only game changer that is possible is, is with the youth voters. Uh, it really depends on how important and how large this base is, right? Uh, so right now, if we look at the uh, Turkish uh, elections, right, um, you know, between uh, Edouan, who has been around uh, for 20 odd years, very strong right wing conservative uh, Islamic uh, leader, compared to uh, his contender, who is, uh, who is more uh, liberal and then uh, more open minded and more secular. Um, the younger voters seem to be swinging towards uh, a change and 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 that could make a real difference right uh, despite the strong base uh, that uh, Edouan has has built for himself over the decades so 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 it, it becomes uh, quite difficult to tell especially if you know uh, in countries like Indonesia with a very youthful um, um, population, uh, where you know the votes could swing, right? And of course, you know uh, it also depends on uh, education level uh, of whether people are easily swayed by particular um, um, by particular incentive as well. So money politics also play a big role uh, in that, um, and um, and sometimes. Uh, uh, Indonesian voters uh, can be quite emotional. So if they are being provoked uh, using particular racial uh, or you know um, arguments based on origins and um, and things like that, that could actually make a difference. So in, in the Indonesian uh, election landscape, it is just so diverse. So it's really hard to really hard to measure because uh, the voters' sentiment uh, can be swayed by religion, by ethnicity, um, by uh, uh, education level, by uh, gender, um, by generation, and so on, by age. So, so 
So it makes it exciting, um, but but also very hard to predict. <laughs> uh, okay. Mahasiswa, ada pertanyaan? Any question or comments? Okay, maybe I will uh, respond to your comments, Prof. Uh, you know that I think there is no uh, authentic liberalism power in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, I thought that the liberal power is behind the Jokowi supporter. Yeah, in the in the previous elections, but when I uh, see that uh, some of uh, Jokowi's supporter also used the same ratio uh, comments to Anis Baswedan. Yeah. They highlight the keaslian, yeah, keaslian of the Anis uh, background. Yeah. Uh, it is quite, uh, for me, apa, mengecewakan, disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> because the liberalism uh, it's not authentic. Yeah, it is just for uh, instrument uh, for the uh, political process. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is Indonesia really uh, pessimistic about the liberal force in in the political or in the social uh, or also in the cultural? Yeah, is it true that Indonesia uh, uh, essentialist? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what do you think about that, Prof? I think primordial sentiments are a, primordial sentiments are a powerful tool that can be manipulated in politics. Uh, um, people use it for their own uh, agenda, uh, for their own gains, uh, especially in politics. Um, but in in reality, if we look at you know Indonesia, you know the uh, despite all the reports of you know, increasing conservatism, increasing intolerance and things like that, you know, um, people that that I know, people that we know, are mostly very open-minded, very toler tolerating, very tolerant, you know. Um, but then um, when, when, when we look at uh, their voting behavior, the election behavior, it shows a different, a different side. Sometimes, you know, they actually... Uh, falls into all this uh, essentialist manipulation, right? Based on race, origin, and language, and things like that. So it, it shows that you know, primordial um, politics is still powerful. So, so yeah. the liberals, it, it's very hard for liberals to to win an election using um, particular idealism, um, because yeah. yeah, people are still stirred emotionally by those primordial. Um, sentiments. Yeah, when you said that uh, uh, the youth generation uh, has a potency, yeah, to become the the force again as a game changer, yeah. But uh, you know, unfortunately, if we see the PSI, the the young, uh, the youth political party, yeah, uh, I think uh, they also bring some. Uh, identity sentiments in their campaign. Yeah, uh, they are not focusing on uh, policies. Yeah, uh, they're focusing on the uh, the public interest. Yeah, they're focusing uh, really on the competition, uh, on the Jokowi. Yeah, really supporting Jokowi and uh, mereka tidak ragu-ragu uh, untuk menggunakan identity. Uh, apa narasi ya untuk menyerang lawan-lawan uh, politiknya. So for me it is very disappointing ya bagaimana kekuatan politik anak muda yang ada di dia representing by the PSI uh, tidak tidak menunjukkan uh, kekuatan liberal yang yang sebenarnya gitu bro. Ya. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is uh, disappointing and very concerning. But uh, but yet uh, uh, that is uh, uh, politics. Uh, even if we look at uh, the United States, one of the oldest uh, democracy, <laughs> is still behaving the same way, right? Yeah. When, when when Trump, you know, accusing all his uh, 
<laughs> contenders with all kind of racial labels and things like that. You know, uh, it's just so immature and so childish. But uh, and, and it doesn't show uh, uh, statesmanship. It doesn't show the reality of where our society is heading. Yeah, but it, in, it but it keeps on drawing on the mythical past. Uh, yet people buy those kind of argument <laughs> and become powerful political uh, tools. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree with that. Teman-teman sekalian, any question or comments? Silakan. Sekiranya ini uh, apa kesempatan yang sangat berharga untuk berdiskusi dengan profun ya. Silakan, teman-teman. Yeah. Yeah, we have a smaller crowd today, so you should not feel uh, shy to <laughs> to speak up. Yeah. Uh, mana nih Habib biasanya bertanya nih Habib maybe it's the end of the semester so <laughs> uh, this is the middle semester middle okay right okay maybe uh, apa? Uh, late afternoon <laughs> yeah yeah that's right yeah. yeah ada berapa mahasiswa di sana prof in 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 Brunei, uh, uh, in your class? Oh, in my class, my class normally at about sixty. Sixty. Yeah. Oh. I teach uh, two modules. I teach uh, advanced social theory and sociology of the body. Oh, that's quite interesting. Sociology of the body. Yeah, very Foucauldian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, how the state try to create a, a docile body. Yeah, I think uh, that's topic relevant also with uh, multiculturalism, yeah, with hybridism. Teman-teman, silakan ada pertanyaan lebih lanjut. Uh, right now, uh, apa? Saya tertarik ya untuk meneliti tentang gerakan. Uh, pilihan Sunda di, di, di Jawa Barat ini as a political movement uh, one of their main goal is to uh, re rename the province with the Pasundan so the West, they want West Java to be the Pasundan uh, province wow. not West Java, West Java province yeah. and, and uh, how successful has that campaign been no, it is not. Uh, I think it's hard for them, yeah, to make the movement successful because the Sundanese uh, itself is diverse, yeah. <laughs> diverse. So, uh, for, for example, uh, the 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 Sundanese in Bogor they refuse, yeah, the movement because uh, it the movement does not represent the Sudanese in that area. And uh, the actor also, you know that in the Sudanese culture, uh, the culture tend to individualist, you know. Uh, historically, uh, we have no central government uh, such as in Japanese. So Sudanese is individually by nature, and then the political movement uh, is hardly to uh, make a success, you know. Uh, however, I, I still interest to to research about the that movement uh, because uh, saya mencurigai uh, bahwa ada faktor-faktor lain ya seperti sentimen terhadap dominasi Jawa. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so in their in their uh, narration, uh, a lot of sentiment to uh, anti Jawa. Yeah, the, the, the bangunan uh, di Jawa Barat is uh, lebih banyak menguntungkan kepada uh, Jakarta yang notabene itu adalah Japanese ya yeah, in their imagination gitu kan di dalam konsepsi mereka itu adalah uh, Jawa uh, mungkin uh, Prof ada uh, saran ya terkait apa tentang topik itu apakah uh, apa, Ini persoalan uh, apa, lebih kepada bagaimana uh, mereka itu 
uh, karena di Jawa Barat ini uh, prof, proses apa uh, development in in West Java uh, ini memang uh, apa dalam tanda kutip destruktif gitu ya compared to the uh, Middle Java or the East Java ya so di Jawa Barat itu uh, rusak tidak beraturan ya urbanisasinya itu tidak beraturan uh, tidak seperti di Jawa Tengah atau di uh, Jawa Timur gitu. dan uh, banyak uh, pendatang dalam tanda kutip ya di, di Jawa Barat ini yang juga sukses ya jadi secara ekonomi memang orang-orang Sunda uh, Sundanis uh, itu uh, tidak banyak diuntungkan dari proses uh, perputaran ekonomi di, di Jawa Barat gitu saya juga mencurigai bahwa uh, apa faktor-faktor itulah juga yang memunculkan pergerakan-gerakan uh, berbasis identitas apa di, di, di Jawa Barat uh, jadi mereka mungkin tidak diakui ya uh, mungkin mungkin gerakan ini juga untuk mendapat pengakuan uh, semacam itu uh, barangkali Prof ada pandangan ya terkait dengan persoalan atau isu-isu yang mungkin serupa dijumpai di tempat lain. Yeah, that, that is so so regretful to to hear because it, it is is it seems like you know it's going backwards rather than moving forward. Um, but Bali also has similar kind of movement, uh, the Ajit Bali movement. Um, and, and a lot of these movements were caused by a threat by the outsiders, like what you talk about. You mentioned about the pendatang, yeah? um, that threatened the, the people who see themselves as the rightful owner of the land. Um, but then uh, the problem is that a lot of pendatang have, have also contributed very much to this place. And they, have, they are no longer strangers. They are here to stay. So they're, they're settlers. And if you... If you Uh, change uh, the province name into a very ethno-nationalist kind of name, then you're excluding uh, all these people who have lived here for generation as well. So, yeah, so so I don't know why, you know, there is an incentive for, for people to want to to crawl back to very uh, exclusive and, and essentialist kind of um, definition when when the world is moving the other direction, right? So, yeah, it, it is very concerning, really. It's very concerning, especially for, for minorities who don't feel that, um, uh, you know, they are represented in this new name. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 it's great to see that the, that the diverse Sundanese community itself actually have alternative voices. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, majority of the Sundanese uh, groups, yeah, or actor, they thought that uh, Jawa Barat is a cosmopolitan area, so it is not uh, correct to replace with the Pasundan province. Uh, however, the movement also uh, supported by nationalist politi politician, yeah, Fadli Zon, yeah. And uh, many of nationalists uh, that also punya pemikiran primordial, yeah, uh, juga mendukung uh, gerakan ini. Yeah. Uh, jadi saya melihat bahwa penamaan kembali apa penamaan Pasundan itu kembali kepada konsep pemurnian itu ya, Prof ya, keaslian ya. Mereka menginginkan ini asli Sunda. Yeah. Yeah. Dan kita bisa mungkin melihat faktor-faktor apa ya yang membuat mereka ingin mendapatkan keaslian itu kan mengekspresikan keaslian itu. Hmm. That's true, yeah. So, so Pak, in in your political science program, um, uh, what what kind of uh, um, I don't know political position <laughs> uh, do do most of you Um, in terms of students and lecturers hold? Is it a very liberal um, place? or I think it is hybrid. <laughs> so you have a mix of both? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we're liberal, sometimes we're religious. Uh, 
<laughs> sometimes we uh, yeah mix yeah sometimes we leftist <laughs> <laughs> but we open Most, uh, uh, apa, secara yeah. umum kita kita open yeah uh, is it a large program yeah is is it a large program uh, political science large program do you have many students oh uh, students kita uh, satu kelas about 40 oh okay right 40 students okay yeah. <laughs> that's great it's, it's it's an honor um for me to get to know your students and also to be invited to your program to to speak to your students yeah sama sama bro kita juga sangat uh, senang ya tadi mendapatkan uh, insight dari Prof. Mudah-mudahan uh, ke depan juga bisa berkolaborasi dalam riset atau juga dalam penulisan Prof. Ya, karena Indonesia ini apa surganya bagi peneliti penelitian nih Prof. Ya, yeah, yeah, just, just masalah di Indonesia yang Just write to me uh... Pak Ari, if you have any interesting topic that you know you feel that you know we can work together, you know I'll be most honored to work with you. Ya senang sekali, Prof. Ya mudah-mudahan nanti kita uh, apa bisa uh, apa kontak-kontak lagi untuk uh, apa mungkin riset dan juga publikasi, ya, Prof. Ya. Ya, ini mohon mohon bimbingannya nih, Prof. Kami kami ini masih berjuang, ya. <laughs> untuk di satu sisi kita harus uh, apa international recognize ya scopus dan lain sebagainya tetapi di saat yang sama uh, administrative burden also <laughs> in everyday activity yeah, gitu. makro ya yeah, we, okay. we learn from each other ya teman-teman yeah. mm. sekalian ada yang akan ditanyakan kalau tidak ada saya kira Uh, kita akhiri uh, perkuliahan ini sekali lagi many thanks to Profesor Chang Hyun ya Chang Hyun uh, terima kasih banyak sudah memberikan materi dan mudah-mudahan kita ke depan bisa lebih banyak uh, bekerja sama lagi terima kasih banyak Prof selamat, selamat, selamat. Ya. selamat sore oke okay.